Welcome to the Future Tech edition of the Finding Genius podcast. Forget frequently asked questions, forget common sense, common knowledge, or Googling for information. How about advice from a genius in their field instead? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% are the geniuses of their profession. Richard has made it his life's mission to interview the geniuses of their fields in areas such as AI, 3D printing, quantum computing, blockchain and Bitcoin, and more. Don't miss out on amazing podcasts with geniuses. Review us on iTunes or wherever you listen and go to futuretech.findinggeniuspodcast.com and subscribe today. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius podcast series. I have uh, Carolyn Curley. She's an associate professor. Uh, she has her own lab, the Curley Lab at uh, University of California, San Diego. We're going to be talking about uh, her research, understanding animal foraging, trophic patterns, and how this drives uh, community ecology. So, Carolyn, thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you asking me to be here. Yeah. Well, I understand what animal foraging is because I do that myself and I get hungry, but what are trophic <laughs> patterns? So animal foraging, in case other people don't know, is when um, animals eat food. And so where they go to eat food, where they spend their time to eat that food, and what they actually eat are important things that we try to figure out in my lab so we can understand what animal trophic patterns are. So trophic just relates to foraging or eating in the wild. And we say things like trophic levels. So a bear would be at a pretty high trophic level, whereas an herbivore would be a low trophic level. Something at the base of the food web, like plants or phytoplankton or algae, that's low trophic level. And the top predator, like a killer whale, would be at a high or the highest trophic level. Is it trophic so level based on, on what it eats, or is it based on uh, the complexity of what it eats? Like what determines the trophic level? The trophic level is based on what an animal eats. So in a really simple food chain, you might have kelp at the bottom of the food web, at the food chain in a marine system. Right above kelp, you would have sea urchins. So the kelp would be the first trophic level. The sea urchins eating the kelp would be the second trophic level. The third trophic level would be sea otters who like to eat sea urchins. And then the fourth trophic level, very top, would be killer whales that like to eat the sea otters. What about um, if an animal is a vegetarian versus uh, an omnivore? Does that change what you so call then, their trophic level? Yes. Yes. And so, for example, in our lab, we did um, a bunch of work looking at impacts of invasive rats on island systems. And this was work I did when I was getting my PhD at UC Santa Cruz. And rats are omnivores. They like to eat plants and animals. And so they would be at an intermediate trophic level. So they might look like they're between a top level carnivore and a lower level herbivore. So they'd be somewhere in between those two. And the way we figure out what trophic level an animal is foraging at is we use a biogeochemical tool called stable isotope analysis. And that allows us to look at the stable isotope ratios of nitrogen and carbon in the tissues of an animal. And by looking at those ratios, we can tell where an animal is foraging in the food web. And that helps us establish those trophic patterns that you were asking about earlier. And I can explain how the technique works because it's kind of interesting, um, but it's this natural phenomenon that we exploit by um, analyzing the contents of stable nitrogen isotopes and stable carbon isotopes in animal tissues so we can figure out where they belong in their food web. So for example... Um, one, one, one quick question before you get into that. Is that how we can know, yeah. um, let's say what a caveman ate or something that died many years ago, what it ate? Yes. So stable isotope analysis came out of work done by anthropologists who were trying to figure out what primitive humans were eating. And they were looking at primarily things like um, corn versus wheat-based diets because those two things have pretty distinct carbon isotope signatures. And so they were able to tell when certain humans started eating, you know, corn versus wheat-based diets. So, yes. 
Well, thank God it's not uh, at a, a super detailed level because then you could say to someone, I'll know if you eat those cookies and I'll know for thousands of years if you ate them. <laughs> exactly. You can't, you can't get that much detail with the technique that we use, but you can get some detail and you can um, use those data as clues to help you figure out where an animal has been eating and what it's been eating. And that, we use those data to try and help further conservation biology. So if you know what an animal is eating and you know why that may be important for its survival, then you can start to target certain food items that might be um, in jeopardy because of human impacts on environment or habitat. So I can yeah, give you lots you know of examples from uh, our work. Yeah, so if the, if, if the animal during a certain season preferentially eats something, uh, you'll know yeah. where it went to, maybe if that item was localized only to one spot. And, you know, maybe if the habitat changes, uh, it can't do that anymore and it changes its behavior. And I guess there's a lot in there to study this stuff, right? Yeah, so there, we have a lot of examples of this. So, for example, um, California condors are highly endangered, right? And there are um, there's only about 450 so left in the wild or left in the world. Half of those are free flying, they're in the wild. And we had a hypothesis, my colleagues and I had a hypothesis that condors who eat on marine mammals, who are forage on marine mammals, might be in danger of ingesting pollutants because marine mammals have higher levels of pollutants. So first we had to figure out if condors were actually even eating marine mammals. And we found that the one flock that's up near um, Big Sur in California, they have access to the coast. They spend a lot of time on the coast. Whereas a flock that's further south, about an hour east of Ventura, California, they don't have access to the coast. They never fly out there. So they don't eat coastal marine mammals. But we used the stable isotope technique to show which animals were eating marine mammals. And then we were able to demonstrate the animals that were eating marine mammals had much higher levels of mercury and PCBs and DDT or DDE, which is a metabolite of DDT. And using the isotope data, we were able to show these animals definitely eat marine mammals because a marine mammal has a different isotope signature than a terrestrial herbivore, which is what the other condors were eating. And then we showed these relationships between high levels of marine mammals in the diet and high levels of all these other toxins. And that helped us to understand cool. that if a condor is foraging on the coast, they're at a higher risk for ingesting high levels of contaminants. And we have well, another great story where, yeah. yeah yeah, and you can, we, um, I had a postdoc, Jack Hopkins, who's now up in Maine, and he and I looked at diets of grizzly bears in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and using stable isotope data, again, we were able to demonstrate that um, seeds from the white bark pine tree were a really important component of grizzly bear diet, and that particular tree is under threat right now. It's pretty much vanishing across the North American landscape because of two main reasons. One, there's a, a native beetle that infests the pine tree, and that particular beetle usually dies off in the wintertime and becomes less of a problem for the tree. But because our winters are now so much warmer because of climate change, the beetle doesn't die off like it used to, and it's killing the tree. And then there's also an invasive um, rust that's also infecting the tree. And so that tree is just being wiped out all across North America. And it's a very important food source for grizzly bears. And because we now know that, it's important to consider the availability of these seeds as food for the bears. And if it vanishes, we have to decide, well, could that potentially decrease the chance for the grizzly bear to fully recover in the Yellowstone region? And it's something to consider when we're thinking about, do we want to keep the bear on the endangered species list in or do we want to delist it? And so we use those types of data to try and inform managers and conservationists on how best to manage populations and habitat to conserve species well, and conserve habitat. Yeah, there's probably uh, keystone foods. You know, a certain animal eats a food and then that animal is eaten by a lot of other animals. So it's funny, at, at lower trophic levels, what those creatures eat can affect all the other creatures that come after them and eat them and eat them and eat them. Yes, and that's that's exactly what's happening with the sea lion story, with the um, or the marine mammals, sea lions that are being eaten by the condors. 
So sea lions in California, that's the main source of marine mammals for condors. And sea lions, California sea lions in California um, breed in the Channel Islands, which is in the southern part of California. And there's a outfall from the Los Angeles sewer system near the Channel Islands. It's called the White Point Outfall. And from the 40s into the 70s, Montrose Chemical Company dumped millions of pounds of DDT into the LA sewer system, which came out at that outfall. And then the electronics industry dumped millions of pounds of PCBs into that same system. And that all just sits at the bottom of the ocean and fish forage on the you know, plankton and kelp, whatever's growing in there and, you, and um, accidentally taking up those poisons, that gets into the fish, then the fish are eaten by the sea lions, and they accumulate those toxins, and then the sea lions are eaten by the condors, and they pass those toxins on. So, yeah, what you said is exactly right. Um, I interrupted you when you wanted to talk about the mechanism, you know, how you look at the oh. isotopes <laughs> and everything. Could you go over that, if you don't mind? Sure, the, the, the chemistry. So, nitrogen and carbon have two stable forms, or two stable isotopes, and the vast one is, for nitrogen, is nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 15, and for carbon, it's carbon 12 and carbon 13. And the vast majority of the nitrogen and carbon in the world is the light isotope, the one that's the 12, carbon 12 or nitrogen 14. But some nitrogen has an extra neutron in the nucleus, and that makes it slightly heavier. And so that would be nitrogen 15. And same with carbon, it has one extra neutron in the nucleus, so it's slightly heavier, it's carbon 13. And for nitrogen, Every time an animal in a trophic level eats something below it, it accumulates that heavy isotope of nitrogen. So, for example, if you start at the base of the food web, um, again, let's think about a marine system. You might have plankton, phytoplankton, or kelp at the base of the food web. That's going to have a really low ratio of nitrogen-14 to nitrogen-15. And so the nitrogen isotope signature of that plant, the algae at the base of the food web, would be really low. But then the thing that eats that, so say zooplankton eats phytoplankton, they would have a slightly higher nitrogen isotope ratio because they accumulate the heavy isotope. You go another step up, say you get up to the fish level, now they're going to have an even higher nitrogen isotope level because they've accumulated even more of the heavier isotope. And that happens with each increasing trophic level. So you can figure out where an animal is in its trophic food web by looking at its ratio of heavy to light nitrogen in its tissues. And that also reflects the trophic level. It can reflect what it was eating and where it was eating because certain areas in, like, say, an ocean system have different levels of nitrogen, um, different values of nitrogen isotopes because of the process um, that drives the uptake of nitrogen in a particular system. And same with carbon. carbon the carbon isotopes vary with location depending on the processes at the base of the food web that um, are incorporating carbon into the base of the food web. And so you can place animals in certain spaces and in certain time using these isotopes. So for example, I'll use an example from our work with sea turtles. So we wanted to find out if loggerhead sea turtles, which are really endangered, how, we wanted to know how much time they were spending off the coast in Baja, in an area off the coast in Baja, Mexico, on the Pacific side. Pacific Ocean side, and we knew they spent some time in the central North Pacific and some time in Baja before they returned to Japan to breed when they were about 25 years old. And we wanted to know how much time they spent in Baja because there's a fishery in Baja that interacts with these sea turtles and accidentally kills a bunch of the sea turtles. And so if the sea turtles spend years and years in Baja, they're going to have a higher chance of being accidentally caught and killed in this fishery. And Luckily, the isotope value in the central North Pacific for nitrogen is five per mil, which is the unit we use to measure different than that off the coast of Baja. And so we were able to tell by looking at the isotope signatures in growth layers of turtle bones from dead turtles, we were able to tell when turtles transitioned from spending time in the central North Pacific to the area off the coast of Baja. And we did that by drilling out the growth layers from the bones. And we could, we knew when the turtles died, and so we could estimate their age when they died and estimate what year each layer inside the bone 
represented, and we could reconstruct the movement patterns of these animals, and we determined that some animals spend up to 20 years in this area of Baja. And if they do that, then they only have about a 10% chance of living to be big enough and old enough to return to Japan and breed. And that's really bad for an animal that is really endangered and takes a long time to breed. So those data can be used by fisheries managers in Mexico to create better rules to reduce the number of turtles that are killed in their fishery. So does that make sense? Is there, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's a big temptation to, I don't know if it's a good idea, but is there, is it a good idea to intervene and alter what some of the creatures in a given local ecosystem are eating, you know, deliberately give them a lot more access to something that's good for them versus bad? Well, so in the case of condors, it would be great if we had the human power to walk to the beaches and anytime anyone saw a condor eating a dead sea lion on the beach to shoo them away and, 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 and try and point them toward other food sources. But I think that that's kind of, it would be very difficult to do in the wild. Well, for maybe for other creatures, if you deliberately put out food for them, you know, I don't know. If we, well, they do. You know, they definitely do that. They definitely do that for the condors. They put out, they call it proffered food, where they put out carcasses of um, cows, dead cows and whatnot for these animals because they want to make sure they have enough to eat. So, yes, we could do that, but it would be kind of difficult. Yeah, I was going to ask you, how could a condor eat a sea lion? But, yeah, I didn't, for some reason, I didn't think it could only eat a dead one. But sea lions are huge. Right, because condor, con, the condors are based, they're vultures, so they eat only dead things. Okay. What, what about, and again, this is probably even worse of an idea, but modifying a low-level food source, you know, plants, uh, either genetically or in some other way, and again, preferring this, this altered food to, uh, to certain animals that would be endangered or have problems. Well, if, you, if, anim, if we discover that an animal or a population of animals is in trouble because they're not getting enough food, which could be the case with grizzly bears if all of those trees vanish, then I suppose you could try and um, create something that would be good for them, but you'd have to get them to eat it and... Um, I don't know. I suppose that you could do that. Yeah. We, we try, our goal is to restore ecosystems to a natural level so that species have access to what they need when they need it well, in a natural yeah. system. Yeah. I mean, there's many things that can disturb or help or yeah. hurt a species. How, you know, in the, in the chain, how important is access to food or the right kinds of food? How much have you seen it affect uh, ecologies? Um, it's pretty important. So, for example, um, one of my PhD students is working on trying to figure out why we have huge die-offs of California sea lions during El Nino years. So, in El Nino years, when you have certain oceanographic processes that occur, that have been occurring for a very long time, that result in really warm water gathering off the west coast of North America. And when you have those really warm water events, then you get much less nutrients being worked up into the um, coastal near shore system. So it's fewer nutrients because um, and off the coast of North America, are, the nutrients are dependent upon cold water being brought up from the bottom of the ocean. And that cold water from the bottom of the ocean has lots of nutrients in it. And that feeds the phytoplankton and that feeds the food web. But during El Nino years, you have warm water sitting there and you have this huge reduction in the amount of nutrients that can come up from the bottom of the ocean. And so you get huge plummets in the um, availability of phytoplankton and other food for the entire food web. And you get sea lions just starving, washing ashore starved, especially baby ones. And so there's an example where there's not abundant food available during those particular years. And we're trying, we're looking at teeth from archived um, sea lions, and we're drilling out the layers of their growth layers in their teeth and reconstructing patterns in their state lifestyle values to try and track what is happening with food availability during warm water years versus cold water years. And we're finding that these warm water years are becoming more frequent with climate change, and this could be problematic as we go into the future for animals that rely on the patterns that have been like climate normal for so many millennia now. So 
Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? So that's an example of when yeah, food availability yeah. can be significantly hampered by um, events that are both natural and cyclical and then are exacerbated by climate change. Yeah, it was and the like, same with the... Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, say, same with that white, white bark pine tree the grizzly bear relies on. Because of climate change, that's becoming a less reliable food source for that particular animal. Because the beetle that infests it is just wiping it out because it just doesn't die off now in the winter. Yeah, I always like to hear of what things you've learned surprised you. So any stories of learning that an animal eats things you never thought it would eat or goes places you never suspected it would go, you know, from all your learnings? Yes. So for back to those rats, um, on islands that I talked about at the beginning. So when, when I was starting that project, we assumed that um, rats introduced to islands in the Aleutian Island chain would be eating the seabirds. And we thought that once those seabirds were gone, we would um, see a certain pattern in the intertidal structure of um the rocky intertidal structure on these islands. And the rocky intertidal is just when the tide is low and you walk down to a beach and you see rocky reefs exposed and you see all the critters and kelp and barnacles growing in the rocky intertidal. And we thought, um, we actually thought that the rats would be eating organisms in the intertidal, like um, mussels and barnacles and um, limpets and chitons, things like that. And it turns out that we saw a completely different pattern because what we hadn't considered and what we found with the data was that the rats were actually eating all the seabirds on the island. And without the seabirds, who are voracious predators of those little critters in the intertidal, without the seabirds eating all of those intertidal critters, you had massive herbivory happening on islands with rats. So the seabirds were gone the intertidal herbivores became hugely abundant because they weren't being eaten and the rats were not eating them either like we thought they would be. And so then you would just get all the kelp would be gone and vanish. And if you were on an island that didn't have invaded, invasive rats introduced to it, then all the birds were intact and they were eating away and all of the intertidal herbivores. And you got um, islands with the rocky intertidal dominated by lots of algal cover. And so this was something we didn't expect at all. And we didn't consider that the rats were eating the seabirds. And the, they do that by eating baby seabirds and their eggs. And so birds come ashore to nest and lay eggs and the rats would just eat them and they wouldn't be able to reproduce. And so you get islands that have rats that don't have any birds anymore. And that was an unexpected sure. consequence that we, we didn't know, yeah. The rats were rat bastards and messing up the ecology. Yeah. Yeah. How do they eat birds, by the way? How would they catch them? How do they? So this is funny. I was just asked this question after I talked about this in a recent class that I'm teaching this quarter. And it's, they go after the chicks that can't fly yet. And they also go after the eggs. Right, all right. That makes sense. So they are rat bastards. Yeah. Um, any, any other uh, examples? Maybe one more example of uh, animals eating or migrating to places you never thought they would go? Well, we have another kind of fun example that was interesting. So I had a colleague from um, Earlham College in Indiana. He, he approached me through one of my graduate students and he wanted to find out why an iguana species on an island in the Bahamas was enormous compared to um, its exact same, the exact same species on other keys in this region in the Bahamas. I said, oh, we can figure that out with stable isotopes. So it turns out that this iguana, which is, gosh, it's like two times as long and like four to six times heavier than the exact same species on the other keys. It turns out that that particular island where the giant iguana was has a population of the type of seabird. And the shearwaters were, um, they go out to sea and they forage and then they come back to the island and they poop all over the island. So there's bird guano everywhere. And that bird poop fertilizes all of the plants on the island. And so the iguanas were eating the exact same things as the iguanas on all of the other keys. However, the plants that the giant iguanas were eating had so much more nitrogen and phosphorus and other nutrients in them because the birds were pooping that out onto the island. 
that they were able to grow to sizes that were unheard of on any of the other keys. And so that was an interesting, fun way that we used stable isotopes to indicate that no, these large iguanas were not diet switching and all of a sudden eating animal material. They were still eating only plants, just that the plants they were eating were so much more nutrient packed because the seabird colony was pooping all over this island. And none of the other keys um, had seabird colonies that were contributing all of this nutrient input from the ocean that these seabirds were on the other key. So that was another cool, so, interesting finding. So what do you think are going to be some of the big implications from your work, other projects you're working on right now that, again, are going to have a large impact? Um, we just, so anytime we try and solve a problem about where an animal eats or where it spends its time, we try to provide those data to the agencies that can do something about um, the problem. So for example, with the rats, um, the Nature Conservancy, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Island Conservation, which is a conservation group in Santa Cruz that was founded by my PhD advisors, they took the data that um, we found that demonstrated the rat impacts on birds and the intertidal, and they used those data to get permission to try and eradicate the rats from at least one of those islands to see if it would actually work. And they managed to successfully remove rats from Rat Island, it used to be called Rat Island. They since renamed it to an Aleut word that I can't recall. And they were successful in that eradication. And the birds have come back to that island in mass. So that's a huge conservation win for seabirds. For the sea turtle example with those loggerheads, um, those data were used by National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration scientists to put pressure on the Mexican government to change the rules for the fishery and now they have rules in place that reduces the bycatch of those sea turtles. We're hoping the data about the grizzly bears relying on the white bark pine seeds will be taken into account when the powers that be try and determine if grizzly bears should be taken off the endangered species list or not. Same with the condors, you know, in future releases of condors to create new flocks, perhaps we should consider not putting them near the coast and putting them more inland. So these are all things that we hope we, we always hope that our data can be used by people who manage these populations and habitats to increase the survival of these species. Does that make sense? So we just want our data to be used for conservation success stories. And every time they are, that for us is a huge benefit or win. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. So Carolyn, excellent. What, what um, any big projects that you're working on <clears throat> that you think will come to fruition in the next year or two? Yes, we're looking, we're reconstructing about 100 years of both killer whale diet data, looking at data from archived teeth in museum collections. And we're also looking at about mm, 70 years of data from northern fur seals, both of which are in the North Pacific and Bering Sea. And we're trying to reconstruct patterns of their foraging to understand why their numbers have declined so much in the last few decades. And then completely unrelated, um, I'm working on a book for, to try and help people take themselves out of groove patterns that are not healthy or productive and better connect with their inner guidance to be more authentic and more happy. Well, very good. What, what's the best way for people to follow up to find out more and, and get in contact? If they Google Carolyn Curley, I'm the only one. So it's K-U-R-L-E, and they can find my website and um, easily find me because there are no other Carolyn Curleys. Okay, very cool. Well, Carolyn, it's uh, interesting work you're doing. It's important, and uh, I think it's cool. I'm, I'm glad you came, and thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Have a fabulous day. You've been listening to the Future Tech Edition of the Finding Genius Podcast. This podcast is information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed. Review us on iTunes or wherever you listen and subscribe today by going to futuretech.findinggeniuspodcast.com.